Quantitative PCR Session 2, an overview of qPCR presented by Robert O'Brien. The topics that will be covered in Session 2 are the differences between PCR and qPCR, why real-time PCR, the PCR mechanism, phases of qPCR amplification, qPCR chemistry, the qPCR process, and the relationship between the CT value and the quantity of DNA. Differences between PCR and qPCR. PCR is known as endpoint PCR, and this is because the products are analyzed after the cycling is completed. So the quantities are static at that point, and it uses gels, capillary electrophoresis, UV, or fluorescence detection. Endpoint assay means that results are viewed at the end. The end result is all that is important. With qPCR, products are monitored as the PCR process is occurring, so it is a dynamic system. Monitoring is occurring once per cycle, and the fluorescence is measured at every cycle. The kinetics of the system are, what is happening during the entire process is what is important, not the end product. Now let's answer the question, why use real-time PCR? And we will do this by going over some of the advantages and disadvantages. First, the advantages. There's an availability of commercial qPCR kits and instrumentation. You have a high throughput and less user intervention. The data analysis is simple, and the software rapidly analyzes data. Some other advantages are that the process is sensitive to the same inhibitors as endpoint amplification due to the presence of an internal control. There is no post-PCR manipulation, and the system has a high sensitivity. Also, there are a large range of quantities that can be detected, and assays can be made to target different types of DNA, and in some cases, these can be multiplexed. Now, for some of the disadvantages of qPCR. At very low or high levels of DNA, the precision may suffer. The system can give the incorrect quantity if the DNA sample is degraded. Also, qPCR assumes the sample is quantified at the same efficiency as the calibrant sample and results are calculated based on the calibrants. So if the calibrants are made up wrong, then the quantities of the samples will be wrong. Let's talk now about the PCR mechanism. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. A result of the PCR reaction is an exponential increase in PCR products. The amount of DNA present theoretically doubles with every cycle of PCR. So starting with one copy of DNA, there is a doubling after one cycle to give two copies, and after two cycles, another doubling to produce four copies, and so on. So you can see from the chart at the side that starting with one copy, after 20 cycles, you can end up with over a million copies. This diagram shows just a brief summary of the PCR mechanism. There are denaturing steps, annealing steps, and elongation steps in every cycle. This will be gone into much more detail during your amplification lectures. And here, once again, we are seeing that how quickly one copy of DNA can become 16 only after four cycles. We will now go into the phases of qPCR amplification. There are four phases that occur during the PCR process. The first phase is the lag phase, the second phase is the exponential phase, the third phase the linear phase, and the fourth phase the plateau phase. This diagram, which is a screenshot from the SDS software for the Quantifiler program, shows all four phases in the amplification plot. We will now go through the phases separately. First, the lag phase. This is the first phase in the PCR process. During this phase, there is an increase in PCR product, but fluorescence produced by this increase is too low to be detected. So during the lag phase, the baseline is what is being set. The next phase is the exponential phase. This is also known as the geometric phase. During the exponential phase, PCR efficiency is at 100%. This is because there is an abundance of all reaction components, polymerase, free DNTPs, template DNA, primers, etc. As the PCR product continues to increase, the ratio of amplitac gold DNA polymerase to PCR product decreases. In the exponential phase, the signal that is received from the fluorescence is in direct proportion to the increase of PCR product. A plot of DNA concentration versus the cycle number on a log scale 
should approximate a straight line. In the linear phase, one or more components of PCR have decreased below a critical concentration. Therefore, amplification begins to decrease. The phase is called linear because amplification approximates an arithmetic progression rather than a geometric increase. Amplification efficiency is continually decreasing during the linear phase. This diagram shows that the slope of the amplification plot decreases significantly during the linear phase. In the last phase, known as the plateau phase, the PCR reaction has stopped. There is no increase in PCR product, therefore no more fluorescence is given off. And the amplification plot is a straight flat line. We will now go over the qPCR chemistry. There are two 5' prime nucleus assays. One for targeting either total human DNA or human male DNA, and the other one for the target of the internal PCR control, known as the IPC. The components of the target-specific assay are two primers for amplifying total human DNA or male human DNA, and one TACMAN MGB probe labeled with the FAM dye for detecting the amplified sequence. We will now go into the specific areas that are targeted by the PCR process. For total human, the human telomerase reverse transcriptase gene, which is the HTERT gene, is what is targeted. Its location is 5P15.33. What this means is that its location is on chromosome 5, on the P arm, which is the short arm, band 15, subband 33. The amplicon length is 62 bases, and this is a non-translated region that is amplified, and it is diploid. For the human male, the targeting region is the sex-determining region of the Y gene, called the SRY. Its location is on YP11.3. This means the Y chromosome on the P arm, which is the short arm, band 11, subband 3. The amplicon length is 64 bases, and it is a non-translated region that is amplified, and it is haploid. The IPC assay components are an IPC template, which is DNA which is synthetic and it is not found in nature. There are two primers for the IPC template DNA, and one TACMAN MGB probe labeled with a VIC dye for detecting amplified DNA. Now for the components of the TACMAN MGB probe. It is made up of a reporter dye. The reporter dye can either be a FAM dye or VIC dye, and it is linked to the 5' prime end of the probe. It has a minor groove binder, MGB, at the 3' prime end of the probe, and also a non-fluorescent quencher, an NFQ, at the 3' prime end of the probe. The MGB at the 3' prime end of the probe increases the melting temperature of the probe without increasing the length. The melting temperature needs to be high so the probe is not destroyed during heating cycles of the PCR. If the probe is too long, then the quencher die and reporter die will be too far, so the signal from the reporter die will not be suppressed. And this suppression is an important part of the qPCR process. The proximity of the reporter die to the quencher die allows for suppression of the fluorescence from the reporter die by a Forster type energy transfer. Now that we have established the chemistry of qPCR, let's go through the qPCR process. There is a 5' prime nucleus assay process, which basically means that the nucleus activity is on the 5' prime end of the probe. It occurs during the PCR amplification, it occurs in every cycle, and it does not interfere with the exponential accumulation of product. Here is a key showing the different components of the qPCR process that will help with the following slides. In the first part of the qPCR process, the TACMAN MGB probe anneals or attaches itself specifically to a complementary sequence between the forward and reverse primer sites. This is shown in the diagram below. In step 2, the Amplitac Gold DNA polymerase begins its polymerase activity, incorporating free DNTPs. The Amplitac Gold DNA polymerase has a 5' prime nucleus activity. It is important to note at this point that the reporter dye is in close proximity to the NFQ, which is the quencher dye, and therefore the reporter dye's fluorescence is being suppressed. As the Amplitac Gold DNA polymerase progresses on the strand of DNA, it cleaves off the reporter dye on the 5' prime end of the probe. As the reporter dye is cleaved, it is no longer close enough to the quencher dye for suppression of fluorescence to occur. As a result, 
fluorescence from the reported dye can now be detected. This diagram shows the cleaving of the reported dye from the TACMAN MGB probe. Notice as it moves away, the red arrows around it are depicting that fluorescence is now being given off. As the Amplitac Gold DNA polymerase progresses, it will displace the probe. This entire process is occurring during every cycle of qPCR. It is important to remember that the IPC, the internal PCR control, undergoes the same process as the template DNA. However, because it is a synthetic sequence and labeled with a VIC dye, its fluorescence is detected separately. We will now explore the relationship between the CT value and the quantity of DNA. The CT value is the cycle at which the fluorescence reaches a high enough level to cross the threshold. A low CT value means it took less cycles for the fluorescence to cross the threshold. If every cycle is a doubling of product, then the product did not have to be doubled many times to reach a certain level. Therefore, the input of DNA would be more if the CT was low. Therefore, the more DNA present, the lower the CT value. Thus, the CT value and the quantity of DNA are inversely proportional to each other. The software is able to calculate the input amount of DNA based on the CT value of the sample. To obtain the quantity of DNA from the CT value, a curve is created using known concentrations of DNA versus their CT values. From this curve, the quantity of DNA from unknown samples can be calculated based on their CT value. The calculation is based on a doubling of the PCR product. Therefore, the portion of the amplification plot looked at is when the PCR reaction is occurring at 100% efficiency. Earlier, we showed that this occurs during the exponential phase. The standard curve that is obtained is a graph of the CT of the standards versus the log of the concentration of the standards. The Quantifile software calculates the regression line by calculating the best fit curve with the quantification standard data points. The regression line formula is the CT is equal to M by the log of the quantity plus B. This fits the formula for a straight line, which is Y is equal to MX plus B. Here, Y is equal to the CT value, M is the slope, X is the log of the quantity, and B is the Y-intercept. Now let's do some simple manipulation of this formula to calculate the quantity based on the CT value. If the CT is equal to the M by the log of the quantity plus B, then the CT value minus B is going to equal to the M by the log of the quantity. The CT minus B over M is equal to the log of quantity, and then 10 to the power of the CT minus B over M will therefore equal to the quantity. When we refer to quantity, we are meaning the starting quantity of DNA. The R squared value is a measure of the closeness of the fit between the standard curve regression line and the individual CT data points of the standards. A value of 1 means a perfect fit. An R squared value greater than or equal to 0.99 represents a close fit. The slope indicates the PCR amplification efficiency for the assay. A slope of minus 3.3 indicates 100% amplification efficiency. The standard curve shows all this information and it is used to assess if the standards for the plate were set up correctly. Here is another screenshot from the SDS software and this is going to show you what a standard curve should look like. It is a straight line and all the points are on the straight line. To the right of the graph are the slope, the intercept, and the R squared values. Now let's go into the importance of the values of the slope and the Y intercept. The reaction efficiency is given by the formula 10 to the power of minus 1 over M minus 1. The reaction efficiency of 100% will be equal to 1. Therefore, 1 is going to equal to 10 to the power of minus 1 over M minus 1. Solving for M, which is the slope, you will get 2 is equal to 10 to the power of minus 1 over m. Taking the log of both sides, you will get the log of 2 is equal to minus 1 over m. Therefore, minus 1 divided by the log of 2 is equal to m. Minus 1 over the log of 2 is equal to minus 3.3. So, a slope of minus 3.3, which is m, gives a reaction efficiency of 100%. For the y-intercept, 
The y-intercept simply indicates that the expected CT value for a sample with a quantity of 1 nanogram per microliter. This is the end of session 2.